Hi, hello, and welcome to Joyful Parenting. We are so happy to have you here, Deborah Veller, and thank you so much, Anuradha and Divya, for joining with me. Deborah Veller, an international storyteller, educator, and a consultant from Florida. She has 40 years of experience in storytelling, and she served the early childhood educators in the state of California for 10 years as a president of California, kindergarten association. And she offers online education and virtual coaching on her website and also in her YouTube channel. Welcome to our channel, ma'am. Thank you so much. I am honored to be in your presence today. And I am honored also by the goals that you have for the people on your various platform to help parents and children and families to be elevated in their literacy goals and to enjoy the beauty of storytelling in their homes. So today, my goal is to be with you, and I want to share several things. I'm going to be doing a demonstration of storytelling versus story reading. Then I'm going to share some slides with everyone that will give you a little deeper understanding of the value of storytelling. But what I'm going to love to do is show you some games that you can do with your children in your families or your school setting that will help to get everybody storytelling in your home or your school setting. That was super excited. We are really looking forward for the session. And before getting into our session, please do share about your journey as a storyteller. Oh, okay. Well, I'll give you the short story version. <laughs> as a mother of a newborn infant, I was home and I was lucky to be home. I was also taking university classes at that time to finish all my teaching certifications. And I met a woman in New Jersey, Lynn, who was going to care for my little daughter a few days a week while I went to school. And we said one day, let's be storytellers. We're already teachers. How can we help families? Now, this was 40 years ago, and we thought there was too much media then. And so we took six months to be brave enough to tell our first stories out in public. Then after we told our first stories, we realized we could not take six months to learn a story. We had to get faster because people were calling us back. And we performed for 12 years together as the Annie Lynn Storytellers in New Jersey. And there we performed in schools, libraries, recreation departments, festivals. I moved to California, so our union was separated. But in California, I found the storytelling community there and founded the South Coast Storytellers Guild. There, I began performing all over the state of California. And as a teacher, I started teaching kindergarten then. I used storytelling as a tool to engage children in after-school storytelling clubs and summer camps so that the next generation of storytellers would be birthed. So for 31 years, I performed all over California, but not just in California. I performed in Vietnam, China, Germany, Scotland, before there was this influx of using these little boxes called Zoom to get us all over the world. I moved to Florida five years ago when I retired full-time from teaching. Then I had to start my storytelling business all over again in that community. But I found the uh, Telltellers of St. Augustine and the Florida Storytelling Association, of which I serve on the board of directors now. Well, then COVID hit. Now what? I couldn't do live anymore. So I made a website got on Instagram, LinkedIn, which is where I found all of you through LinkedIn and Instagram and Facebook. And then before you know it, I'm performing in India quite frequently <laughs> and being part of the Early Childhood Development Forum with Dr. Vasabi, writing articles for them and doing workshops. And now I travel all over the world and most recently 
in person at the Morocco Marrakesh Storytelling Festival. So it's been a wonderful opportunity. The silver lining of the pandemic was reaching out and finding my new friends like you. Wow. That was a lengthy journey <laughs> and nice, nice to hear from you, ma'am. Thank you. And the journey continues. <laughs> of course, yes. <laughs> so now, would you like me to start my presentation? Yes, please. Ma okay. Well, what I'd like to demonstrate first is storytelling versus story reading. Story reading is the goal of our literacy in our homes. Do you know that if children between the ages of one and five are read three books a day, by the time they are five, they will have a vocabulary of 50,000 words in their native language and or other languages that they might be introduced to. So a child who has not had that is already coming to formal schooling with a deficit. But where does that beautiful beginning start? In our homes, with the children in our laps, whether it's grandparents or aunties and uncles or anyone contributing to that reading, if moms and dads are busy working, or in the daycare setting where the children are being read to. The goal is read to your children, and not just when they're small. You can read aloud chapter books as a family as they go on into their teens. So as parents, they need to see us reading also because we set the example of how important literacy, whether it's reading off of a tablet or reading from a book, they need to see us reading and engaging with print. And our homes should be that place where books are available, whether you're getting them from a library or if you have in your community a way to share books so that moms and dads are passing on the books in your developments and in your homes so that when you run out of books in your home, you can share these books and recycle them. So now I'm going to share the first story I learned how to tell. And believe me, it's a process to be brave enough to close the book and tell your own story. The first story I learned how to tell was Millions of Cats. Now, what I'm going to do is just read a couple of the pages, then close the book and tell the story. I am not promoting storytelling is better than story reading. Each has its own place. When we read to children, they see the print. They see the words. The illustrations can help our pre-readers understand the story. So it's very important that we use the beautiful illustrated books to help the children in their pre-reading skills and to understand. And then the book becomes like a storyboard for them. So as you know, young children love to hear a story over and over again. And before you know it, they can tell that story the same as the parents. When we read a story several times, it's in our head. And we don't have to be perfect when we retell it. We, I don't memorize my stories. I remember them. Like basic comprehension. The beginning, the middle, the end. Who are the characters? And of course, make it fun with voices and sound effects. Because that's how you engage your children. And you can invite them to chant any repetition or phrases in the story. Millions of Cats by Wanda Gog. This book was written in 1941, but it is a classic indeed. Once upon a time, there was a very old man and a very old woman. They lived in a nice clean house, which had flowers growing all around it, except where the door was, but they couldn't be happy because they were lonely. One day, the woman went to her husband and said, Dear, dear, can you get me a nice, white, fluffy little cat? We don't have any children, so let's get a pet. Well, uh, yes, dear, I think that would be a good idea. 
Well, I'll get the house ready. You go find the cat. So he put on his hat. He put on his jacket. He opened the door and he walked out into the bright sunshine. He went over the hills and down the dales until he came to a place that was covered with cats. Cats here, cats there, cats and kittens everywhere. Hundreds of cats, thousands of cats, millions and billions and trillions of cats. Oh dear, oh, what am I gonna do? I want one little cat, but I can't choose which cat to take home. They're all so beautiful, stripes and blue eyes and brown eyes and spots. Which one will I take home with me? And he talked to the cats and he said, how about if you all come home with me? And the cats meow, 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 meow. The cats got in a line behind him. Hundreds of cats, thousands of cats, millions and billions and trillions of cats. And they pranced behind him with their paws and twitched their little tails. But after a while, they called out, meow, meow, we are hungry, cried the hundreds and thousands and millions and billions and trillions of cats. The man looked here and looked there. Oh, oh, oh. There's a big hill over there with lots of grass on it. I know that's not what cats usually eat, but that's all I can offer. And the cats began to munch. <sniffs> with all those cats eating the grass, the hill was bare. And now it was mud covered. But the cats were happy in their tummies. And they got back in the line to parade, marching with their little paws and moving their tails back and forth. But after a while, they got thirsty. Meow, meow, we're thirsty. The man looked here and there and he said, oh, there's a big pond over there. Maybe that will quench your thirst. And the cats got their little pink sandpaper tongues and they began to lap up the water. <laughs> and soon the pond was empty. Well, now their bellies were full and they marched behind the man. But back at the cottage, the woman was getting ready for her one nice, white, fluffy kitten. So she was cleaning her windows and she was shaking out the rugs and sweeping the floor. She got a little bowl and set it aside for the cat's water and another little bowl for the cat's food. She took a basket and put a soft blanket in it for the cat's bed. Oh, I can't wait to meet my one nice, white, fluffy little kitten. Then she went over to the window to look out. She parted the curtains. Oh, 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 no. She opened the door, ran down the road, and ran up to her husband and put her hands on his shoulders, looked him right in the eye and said, dear, what have you done? Well, I couldn't choose which cat to bring home. So I brought home hundreds of cats, thousands of cats, millions and billions and trillions of cats for you. Oh, but dear, oh dear, what will we do? They'll eat us out of our house and our home. They'll sleep in our beds. We can't take care of all these cats, my dear. I know you had good intentions, but we only need one cat. Well, how are we gonna how we're gonna tell them? Let's have a contest. We'll ask which one is the prettiest cat. So they called out, Which one of you is the prettiest? And the cat started to meow. I am. I am. I am. I am. I am. Cried the hundreds of cats, thousands of cats. Millions and billions and trillions of cats. Oh, oh, they made a terrible noise. The old man and woman covered their ears, ran into their house, 
and hid under the bed. They waited a while. Then they listened. They couldn't hear any cats. They were afraid they were fighting. And then they looked out the window. They didn't see any cats. No cats? What happened? Oh, I suppose they scared one another away. Well, let's go out and check. Maybe, maybe there's at least one little cat left. So they went outside and they, they couldn't see any cats right away. But in the tall grass was one little tail twitching back and forth. It was black fur with a white tip. They went over and looked down. Ah, oh, it was a kitten, black and white little kitten. And they looked down at it and then they picked it up and said, how is it that you were not eaten up by hundreds of cats, thousands of cats, millions and billions and trillions of cats? Oh, I'm just a homely little kitty and nobody bothered about me. Well, you're our cat now. They brought it inside and gave it food. And they loved that cat for a very, very lifetime. Millions and millions of cats. And now, for my listeners and also for our panel here, what did you notice? You can unmute yourselves and tell me, what did you notice the difference between reading the story versus telling the story. What did the storyteller do to engage you? Expression. Uh, you actually uh, made us to imagine the scene. Uh, I could imagine a mountain with full of grass, a pond with full of water, and the lady opening that door. I could imagine that, and the millions of cats are standing over there. Uh, all the images I could uh, see there. And the expressions uh, brought in the images together. Okay. Anyone and, else? And I, uh, the repetition of the words, the millions, hundreds and thousands and millions and billions. So these words were repeated and uh, we can be able to keep and imagine how the bigger and the bigger the size of the cat was marching towards the house behind the man. And uh, how the emotion of the women, the you know, by looking at that, and without, and uh, when you read a book, we can't keep everything in mind. But when we tell the story with this emotion and the expression and the narration part, with the voice modulation, everything, uh, it, it will stay in our mind for long and long and long. Yes, and Swati. The expressions and voice modulation makes a story so lively and it helps to develop its imagination. They'll imagine by their own. That's the power of storytelling. That's mm -hmm. a very important skill to learn for them. Yes, and your video was going in your head. As Dia said, your video is going in your head. So the children and the family, they're making their own videos. And do you know what the studies have shown recently? Some studies are coming out that the heartbeat of the listener syncs with the heartbeat of the storyteller. Wow. The rhythm of the story, the beauty of the story. And as you said, that repetition, well, what is that? It's teaching vocabulary and rhyming with the children. Now, yes, you can read a story with lots of expression too, but I would recommend in a family setting, you know, read the story on Monday, read the story on Tuesday, but on Wednesday, close the book and invite your children to help you tell the story with you because they're doing the rhyme and repetition as you said, you were envisioning the story. It also, the story goes into long-term memory. PET scans have actually shown that when listening to stories similar to classical music, all of the areas of the brain are lighting up, the same as in reading a story. All the areas of the brain light up. When children are playing video games, only the 
back part of the brain lights up. So they're not fully using their brain when they're engaged with a screen. So what do we learn? We learned that, first of all, do you have to tell the story like I did? No. You tell it in your own way, with your own personality. I tell it my way. You tell it your way. You do not judge and say, oh, I can't tell a story because I can't tell it like her. No, 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 no. Your children are going to love you telling the story, then when you hand it over and have them take turns telling the story, you create this community within your family where you honor one another. Your child, when they are being a storyteller, they are learning a valuable skill of public speaking that can take them through their life for all the reports that they have to give at school or standing up and doing recitations. Storytelling is the key to developing that confidence in the home first, where everybody loves you, so that when they go out to school and they have to give presentations and later on in the business world, they'll feel confident and not so worried and fearful of who they are. Fables are a wonderful beginning story and the Panchatantra tales, cultural stories that are beautifully done, stories of gods and goddesses, the holiday stories, you know, where you honor your gods and goddesses and to bring those to life in your home. Yes, they can play act it too. Costumes, puppets. Making all kinds of things that will help them. A good way for them to do that is to, they can draw a storyboard about the story. This will increase their comp comprehension and it will also break them from feeling like, oh, I have to memorize that story word for word. When they draw a storyboard of the sequence of the story, then they can put down the book and just tell the story using their storyboard first. And eventually they won't need their storyboard because they'll do it. So I highly recommend it could be fun with the family event is that you make storyboards together of your favorite stories and tell those stories. Any questions on this part before I go on to a little presentation with some slides? Uh, nope. Yeah, the, the, you were just mentioning about the puppets, right? So how to use the puppets as a mother uh, in, in early child uh, development? How it is possible? Well, puppets it can just bring things to life. And it doesn't have to necessarily be a puppet that you go out and get. It could be the doll, the Legos, you know, whatever you have, any little objects in the house could become a puppet. A paintbrush could be the mother bear, okay? <laughs> Anything that you have. So I have a variety of things. Like I might make something. This is a little sheep. Mary had a little lamb. Little lamb, little lamb, Mary had a little lamb. Its fleece was white as snow, and it's just a stick. And I cut it out and put some cotton on it. I also went finger plays for our very young children. This is a little finger play that helps learn language. Five, four little ducks went out to play. Over the hill and far away, when Mama Duck called with her quack, 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 three little ducks came waddling back. Three little ducks went out to play over the hill and far away, when Mama Duck called with her quack, 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 two little ducks came waddling back. I won't finish it completely for time's sake, but what are we doing in that little finger play? We're teaching subtraction. 
So we're teaching math in a finger play story. And we're teaching them rhyme, rhythm, repetition. Then your children can hold the little puppets or characters that you make. And I also use my regular hand puppets too, that I have lots of them that help to tell the story. In fact, I'm going to go get Purple Monster right now. <gasps> Wait just a second. He's right over here. <gasps> Purple Monster, wake up. Oh, there he is. Purple Monster has been with me for 41 years. And he went to Morocco. Purple Monster, say hello. Hello. Puppets can be used to solve social, emotional issues with children in the family. And when you have a problem, let's say, calling one another names, teasing, you know, yelling at one another where they, you know, children do this, right? Mm -hmm, they do. <laughs> and so the puppets can also create stories that help children know the difference between right and wrong. So instead of saying to your child, you better stop that right now. I am tired of hearing you talk to your sister like that. A more gentle way and a teaching way would be to work it out with the puppet. Purple Monster, we have a problem that I've noticed. What's the problem? Well, I noticed that you're calling your little brother names and it hurts his feelings. What? He's so little. How could it hurt his feelings? Well, Purple Monster, when you call people names that are unkind, it can make people's hearts sad. Like if I were to say, you stink. You would tell me I stink? Yes, Purple Monster, if I say that, how do you feel? I would feel sad. Yes, Purple Monster, and when you talk to your brother like that, it makes him feel sad. Can we think of another way that you could talk to your brother? Could you find some sparkling words to use this week? To help your brother feel happy? Oh, yes. I could try it. What if I said, you're my friend? Oh, I think he would love it. Would you try it this week? And you know what? Every time I hear you saying sparkling words to your brother, and he's saying them back to you, we'll make a little coin in a jar. By the end of the week, We'll see how many coins we have. By the end of the month, maybe we could get an ice cream. We'll call it our kind word jar. I'll try. That's what it's all about. And I'll be noticing how you try, Purple Monster. So that's an example of how parents can create story to solve problems in the home things you have to deal with instead of yelling and, you know, go to your room kind of things. It's a much more gentle way of parenting to help them. And then you engage the child in the problem solving too. And I find other little puppets about. These are just some things I found in a party store where these could make stories, a story about a bear and a little girl. So when you have a variety of these things around, you can create story in your home, but you don't have to go out and buy things. Maybe you have some objects in your home and like this is just some beads and a, a reindeer. Well, how could those be connected? Once upon a time, a reindeer was out going in the snow and he was shuffling about and he crunched on something with his hoofs. When he looked at it, it was a string of pearls. The reindeer thought, I don't wear pearls, but somebody must have lost them. So the reindeer reached down and put the pearls on his beautiful antlers and went back toward the town. When he got in the town, a woman was there and saw and said, oh, reindeer, where did you find those pearls? They were deep in the snow. Oh, reindeer, those were my grandmother's pearls. And I thought I lost them forever. Thank you for finding them for me. So that is just a little story 
that you can make story creation with the objects you have in your home, engaging your children, engaging them in conversations, but most of all, giving them an opportunity to develop storying in the home. So any questions or comments? Now I'd like to get into the slides. We'll go briefly through them. Yes, yes. Okay, so I'm going to go on to share content right now. It'll take me just a few seconds to get that pulled up. And while I'm doing that, I want you to think of stories, favorite stories that you could tell to your children. And I'm finding them right now and I'm looking for my file and I have it right here to bring up. And we're always excited when technology works, or at least we hope it works. <laughs> if not, I will move into those things. Hmm. It doesn't seem to be connecting properly. Oh, yay, magic. Okay. <laughs> so now I'm just going to go through a few slides about family storytelling. So who am I? Well, you heard my introduction. And yes, I'm a professional storyteller and educator. You can find me on Instagram at Deb Storyteller and on my website. Let's talk about how storytelling affects the brain. Well, the studies are showing that a story activates parts of the brain that allows the listener to turn the story into their own ideas and experiences. Like you said, you, you made your own video when I was telling a story. There is also mirroring that takes place because when you listen to a story, your brain will bring in that experience that you might have had, a similar experience, something familiar. The dopamine is released in your brain when you listen to a story. So it helps you to understand and remember that story. And in our cortex, we process facts. Do you know? Think of all the facts you had to memorize when you were learning at school. If those facts are not connected to story, they only go into short-term memory. But when you connect facts and data into a story, it will become your long-term memory. So why do I tell stories? Because children need the human connection, and the family is the first place to start that. There's a rather sad thing that many children have lost their skill for visual thought. As the youngsters listen to stories told directly to them, this is exactly what we talked about before. We're visualizing, we're identifying with the characters. We can have empathy for the characters and we can comprehend the language. Why should we use fairy tales and fables? Fairy tales make great and psychological contribution to the child's inner growth. When we tell the fairy tales and the fables, we help them to work through life situations. Then they have a little roadmap of how to solve problems. So I use story sticks. And in your family, you can make a story stick out of anything. They had their origin in Native American talking sticks, but they've been found in various cultures throughout the world. And it's an honor to use a story stick. So in your family, you could gather your family in a circle. And what you want to do, it's a great way to check in on your children and sit in the circle and say, how did your day go at school today? Can you tell me something good that happened at school? Can you, you another thing was, what is a good memory you have of your favorite birthday? So you come up with questions to engage your children, it's a safe place. And 
Only the person holding the story stick gets to talk. We have to be respectful listeners when we're passing the story stick. Each person gets a turn to speak. So how could you make one? Well, you could get a dowel and decorate it, a stick that you find outside, put some ribbons and sequins on it. You might want to use a glue to glue all those things on. But you could also take a shoe and decorate a shoe and make a story shoe. You could use stuffed animals like a bear, make it the story bear, or a rock that you paint, and it's your story rock. So it would be a fun activity in your family to have everybody make a, some kind of a story stick, story rock, something that could be used in the family to have this story time. Now, story stick rules. Your family sits in a circle and you want it to be a sacred time. So maybe once a week, or if you see a problem in your house, maybe emotions are running high and they need comforting or they just need to express themselves, bring a story stick out and say, hmm, I notice we're all feeling a little bit sad today. Do you think we could talk about our sadness and ways that we could feel better? So the person holding the stick is the speaker. Everyone else is the listener. And you want to teach your children to speak in a bold storyteller's voice, not to whisper, to be proud of their voices and to speak out so each person can hear them. Now, when we are storytelling, we are developing vocabulary with our children, whether we're reading the book or we're telling the stories, just like in Millions of Cats. We talked about cats here, cats there, cats and kittens everywhere. It was rhythm and rhyme. And children, if they are learning another language, not their native tongue, it's a nice way to read them stories in other languages too. That way they hear the native tongue, but they get exposure to the other language. So I'm going to start with a little activity I call picture cards. So what I do is I have, you could have your children cut out pictures from magazines or any kind of print or get them off the internet and make story cards. I make story cards with pictures of people, places, and things. Then we put them in a little box. And I say, we're going to tell stories with story cards tonight. Each person gets to choose three cards. You give everyone time to look at their cards. And it's not about just describing, like, for instance, the baby. We're not just going to describe the baby, like, oh, there's a baby here with blue eyes wearing a hat. No, the purpose is we're going to make a story about that baby. Now, initially, you might want to just choose three cards and the whole family group makes a story with those three cards before you give it to each person um, individually. And you want to teach them how to have a short story that might have a beginning, a middle, and an end. One day, a little baby went out crawling in their house. And they noticed the sunshine coming through the window. The baby was very happy to feel the sunshine and enjoyed playing in the sunshine with all of their toys. That would be an example of a very short little story with a beginning, a middle, and an end, but it's very, very short. Now you could further that story by making the characters come alive. And I'll show that to you a little bit later. So to make your picture cards, again, just cut the pictures out, either glue them on heavier paper or three by five index cards. And for the first time, they can name what the objects are. Then you want to help them to make a story and tell their story. Storytelling with objects. I'm sure you have lots of objects around your house. Find those things, even cooking utensils, and start to story about the objects that you found in your house. 
and maybe make a little box of objects. You know, when the children are having, uh, need some quiet time and mommies and daddies need some quiet time, tell them, go over to the story box, pull out some story cords or find some story objects and make yourself a story. Draw a picture about that story. And if the children are old enough, write your story. So this gives the child some autonomy and some options of what to do instead of always pulling out their screens. And I love using things that are in our home to make funny stories, like a smelly sock. And what kind of imaginative stories could your family create in a story circle about a smelly sock? Or an old shoe? Or a piece of clothing? What could you use that would make fun? The goal is, are we having fun doing this? It doesn't have to be a lesson. It's about fun, creating family community and connection with these kinds of storytelling games. If you have any mask in your home or you make mask, then the children can act out stories with the characters and have the characters have different voices and sounds. So masks can come in handy. And again, they can just be made out of paper. They do not need a lot of fancy things to make them. So now let's talk about the important things we need to have as a storyteller. And these would be the things that you would help your children understand. When you create storytelling in your home, you want it to be a sacred activity. Like, oh my goodness, we're going to have story time. Maybe you turn the lights down low or light a candle. Create a special place where that story will happen. And you want to teach your children about making eye contact when they tell a story, looking at every member of the family, using a clear voice so that everyone can hear, and also not speaking too fast. Once upon a time, there was an old man and a woman had a cat. We don't want to talk like that. We want to teach our children to have cadence in their voice. Once upon a time, there was an old man and an old woman, so everyone can process the language. We teach them about our voice being loud, and the old man and the old woman looked out at the cats and called out, which one of y'all is the prettiest? And when the woman was stroking the cat, she used a soft voice, an expression in her voice, oh my, oh no, pausing in her voice. I turned the corner and what did I see? Gestures to make the characters we don't want to flail our arms anyway, but it's almost like drawing a picture with your hands about what that might look like, a flower growing, a little house. What would it look like petting a cat? You are using gestures. And of course, our facial expressions. That's what brings the story alive and makes fun. And emotions can be showed for the characters, because that's what creates empathy in our children. And a nice way to do that too is just to discuss it later about, well, how do you think that character felt? Then they start to identify that people have feelings and when animals are personified in a story or objects are personified in a story and take on emotions, it's through the character of the animal, the children can then learn about how their emotions. So social emotional learning is very important. Now, if you want to be a storyteller and have fun, you need to choose a story you really love. And I suggest for beginning storytellers, short stories like the Panchatantra tales or fables, because they're short or picture books that only have two or three paragraphs of print because you don't wanna bog yourself down in trying to learn a very long story. The best stories are told within three to five minutes or even one minute. <laughs> so you want to 
I don't memorize my stories, but if you read the book three to five times, then close the book, maybe draw a little storyboard of the sequence of the story, or just write down some phrases about the story, then you can remember it. You might not remember every detail. That's okay. You can always go back and polish up your story later. But just close that book and have fun telling what you remember and maybe even embellishing that story with some new things in it as well. If you remember your beginning, middle, and end, it kind of puts you on the story path. You might want to commit the first two lines of the story to memory and the end lines of the story. It's kind of like when you tell a joke, you want to know the punchline, right? So you want to be able to get there. Play with the characters, have fun. And the best way to learn to tell a story is to tell that story frequently. Tell it to the wall, tell it to the dog, tell it to your book, tell it to a pillow, but most of all, tell it to people. Now, when you visualize your stories, you want to, because when I told my story before, you told me, that you were visualizing the story and making your own video. So as a storyteller, you have the responsibility of bringing the story to life to the listener. So you want to make sure your words are clear enough that the listener sees what you're seeing and maybe they see it even more based on their own imagination. But the storyteller wants to rehearse their story a little bit, but not making it too polished in your family. Just have fun with it. If you go on to perform that story, yes, you want to be more polished. But in your own family, just have fun. So creating a story community in your family is a legacy gift. You are starting that tradition. Maybe your grandmothers and grandfathers and aunties told stories to you. And you remember those stories. And telling your family history stories are so important. They need to know about grandmas and grandpas. They need to know about your childhood. They need to know the hard times in your life. They need to know how you overcame a challenge. Because this is a legacy for them. They will tell their own children for generations of time. Record those stories. Write those stories together so that they have this legacy gift. Any comments before I show some of the games? That was so wonderful. And family time is more important for a healthy development of a child. And a family stories also plays a major role, uh, which they, they can know about our family and our history is very important because in uh, at present situation, families are scattered and mm -hmm. we, are, we, are, uh, we are moving to another country and they, they are mm -hmm. not in touch with uh, grandparents lively. Uh, so it's very important to tell our family stories. That was a nice uh, good thing to learn for us we need to proceed with our kids okay thank you anyone else have a comment before i share some of the games i'm going to share a few games and then i'll open it up to questions that you might have so that our listeners can get a full opportunity to experience this so some of the games i mentioned i mentioned the story stick I happen to find this beautiful one. I'm always looking for story sticks, but you can make your own. This one just happened. I found it in a shop and I use it so that gather the family together, make it sacred. It's story stick time. Each of us are going to share. You can start with leading questions or if the children are old enough, give them the responsibility each week to come up with a question for story stick that is open-ended enough so everyone can participate. And if we liken it to ourselves, we can get those stories made. We can also say, like, I might start with, what's your favorite color and why? 
What is the favorite memory of a birthday party? Tell me a time when you felt happy. Tell me a time when you felt sad. We want to avoid the one word answers. So we leave it open ended so that each person gets a chance to say something. Another thing you can do is build a story together. One person starts out with once upon a time on a rainy afternoon. I went for a walk outside and I found a golden coin. Then you pass the stick to the next person. And they continue the story. Story sticks can also be for planning. Like we're planning a family vacation. What should we do? Or maybe you want to learn something together as a family. Let's say you're going to have a family learning session. What do we know about penguins? First, you get everybody to say something they know. Then you maybe read some books about penguins, watch some videos about penguins. You come back and you do a check, like check for comprehension and learning. What did we learn about penguins? And now everybody says something they learned. So it's a wonderful way. It has multi-uses, a story stick. I also like using emojis. You can print, make a bunch of these off of Google and just print them. And you can have these emoji cards and we can give them out to the family members. And this is a way to get in touch with emotions. So we might say, let's say, I don't want soup for dinner in an angry voice. I don't want soup for dinner. But now let's say it in a surprise voice. Oh, I don't want soup for dinner. Let's say it in a happy voice and we'll change the don't to I want. I want soup for dinner. And now we'll be a little confused. I, I don't want soup for dinner. So emojis can be a fun game where you can learn to attach emotions, then you can transfer it into your storytelling by saying, well, show me the bear being confused in the story. I don't know who came into my house. I was out looking for some food. And now there's a girl in our house. I'm so confused. So the emojis can be little prompts for stories. Another, uh, this is the picture cards. And I wanted to show them up close to you of how they can work. So I have a picture of a fox and I have a picture of a baby and I have a picture of a house. Now, as a whole family, we can make a story together. Or individually, we could each have our own set of cards and make a story individually. And you give everybody about five minutes to think about their story. And then they tell their story. Once upon a time in a lovely blue house that had trees growing all around it, there was a beautiful baby. The baby decided one day to toddle outside. Mommy was in the kitchen. Daddy was busy. But the baby opened the front door and went outside to explore all by himself. The baby was smelling the flowers, looking at the trees when a fox came along. Now the baby never saw a fox before, so the baby wasn't frightened. And the fox had never met the baby before. And the fox came up and sniffed the baby, and the baby giggled. The fox, though, being a mama fox, knew this baby should not be outside by itself. So the mama fox nudged the baby back to the front door and nudged the baby into the house so the baby would be safe once again. So that's just an example of how you can take picture cards, again, 
just using the imagination. There's no need to practice, no need to make it formal, just kind of spontaneous storytelling. Now, the children might not feel real comfortable, and you might not feel real comfortable with it at first. But the more you practice, the easier the language will come. As a storyteller, we have to trust our own language and not feel that we can only use the language that's printed in the book. We have to realize we have that rich language to use. So the story cards, you can make a bunch of them, have the kids make them, you know, get out their glue sticks and make a bunch, just keep them there. And they have them. Now, if you go on a car ride, you could bring some of these with you and practice telling the stories in the car as we know are we there yet why is it taking so long our train ride you could put a few in a little pouch and have them ready as games to go i talked about the stinky sock stories this was my son's sock he had big feet he's six foot three inches tall but as a young boy his socks Hmm, get a little smelly. Of course, I washed this one. But this can be the start of fun. An old shoe, a sock, anything that you have around the house. And you might start off, someone would start off the story and you build the story together. Each person taking a turn. I went out in the yard one day and the wind was blowing so hard. And behold, a sock floated down from the wind and landed right in front of me. I thought, oh, where did that come from? It's dirty, it's smelly. But the sock spoke to me and said, take me home, take me home. A talking sock? Now that could be the beginning of a story that you share with your family. It just gets it going. And everyone adds something else. Before you know it, we'll be laughing together as a family. And laughter is good medicine. So what I've shown you today in our time together is some fun tools. I demonstrated reading versus telling, talked about storyboarding, talked about picture cards, story stick using objects, making your own little puppets, smelly socks. All of these things are things that you don't have to spend a lot of money on. Things you can find in your home to engage your family. You could also see that it could make fun birthday party games when other children come over. So it's endless the amount of things that you will discover that you say, oh my gosh, that would make a fabulous storytelling game. So with that, I want to open up to any questions that you might have, my beautiful panel here of these distinguished mothers. So I would like to open up to any questions or comments or did anything I say strike something in your brain that you said, oh my gosh. I can do that at my house. Yeah. Yes, Vivian, go ahead. Sure. Uh, Dev, we could use all the games that you explained us. Damn sure all the materials are available. We can engage them. I hope all our mummies will do that. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much. That was a lot of information you shared for mummies. For the starters, for the storytellers, it will be useful for everyone. And I have one last question. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think about uh, storytelling in education, like uh, teaching science and math concept? And uh, do you have a personal experience in your journey, uh, storytelling in education? Can you uh, share with us? Yes, I will. As a teacher for 35 years in the early childhood setting, as well as teaching and training teachers, and adults, storytelling has always been the heart of my curriculum. So I put storytelling in the center and from storytelling, I teach English language. I teach vocabulary. 
I can teach spelling. I can teach writing. Math problems, story problems, right? We can create those story problems and solve them by drawing our pictures, using manipulatives, training our brain to understand the language of the story. Science, oh my gosh, science lends itself because there's so many beautiful stories written about how the sun and the moon got in the sky, how natural phenomena start. Think about the water cycle, evaporation, condensation. You can make a story. Once there was a little puddle and the sun shone down. And when it did, it heated up the water so that the water vapor evaporated and made a cloud. When the cloud was so full, the condensation occurred inside of the cloud and droplets formed. Pretty soon the cloud was so full, precipitation came down that day in the form of rain and a new puddle formed, bringing the water cycle, the growth cycle, life cycles, habitats. We can tell stories of animals and put their habitats in there. We also have physical education. What do the characters do in the story? They might leap, they might jump. So we can leap, we can jump, we can be all those characters. We can be the elephant, we can be the tiger. So I see the social emotional, I don't wanna leave that part out because what do stories specifically teach us? Social emotional. We learn lessons in a lot of stories. Now, not every story needs to be a formal lesson, but when we teach children to have critical thinking, we go to the story and we think, how did the characters in that story solve a problem? What can we learn from them? How does it affect our own life? So it becomes a starting point for discourse, problem solving, and conversation. So I believe storytelling is truly what can drive the curriculum. Anyone else have a question or a comment? Uh, Deb, I have to say thank you. It is not the only word we can say. Uh, really, the one hour session, one hour the talk that you shared, you know, it was uh, amazing. And uh, it was very helpful as a storyteller and as a parent, how we can work with the children. And as a family, you know, now family time is uh, going very low. Uh, we are mm -hmm. talking to each other, we are, everyone are engaged with the mobile or any gadgets. Uh, children in front of the YouTube or any cartoon or any something. So we are just, you know, isolating ourselves inside our own house. So this definitely helps the parents to, uh, you know, get together or sit together mm -hmm. with their uh, food or with the stick that you told and sure they will, uh, you know, enhance this tips uh, inside their uh, family room, <laughs> I believe. Yes. Thank you. And one of the things I forgot to mention was one of the most important things in a family, and that is our food and how we can make stories about the recipes, how we got those recipes, where did they come from? So that's another whole aspect of family storytelling is the memory of the food and the celebrations. Absolutely, yes. And thank you so much. <laughs> Welcome. That was a visual treat session, ma'am, and really we enjoyed a lot. And play based learning is the best way of learning, and what I always believe. And now I'm following with my kids as well. And you shared a lot of tips, and uh, we can even create a story with whatever we have in our hands, in our in our home. That's wonderful and uh, so nice. It's been my long time wish to collaborate with you and finally <laughs> today. And <Yay>. once again, <laughs> yes. 
and thank you so much for accepting our request on your bishu shuttle and back to back trips <laughs> thank you so much thank you